All right, here's your period seven review for the pre-World War II part of period seven. First off, remember we start with the 1920s boom. 1920s boom was leading to a lot, it was caused by a lot of things. We talked about how during World War I, the farm sector was growing at a rapid rate, which that's also going to eventually be part of the bust. Um, in the 1920s, we talked about um, Americans had, I think it was 40% of the world's wealth. Also, we talked about a lot of Americans were living beyond their means. So this prosperity was a big fake prosperity, really. Um, in the 1920s, you know, we talked about things like prohibition, which basically just gave rise to organized crime. We talked about things like the Volstead Act, accompanying that. But another thing we need to recognize with the 1920s boom was this led to a period of isolationism. The United States backing away from involvement with the rest of the world. And then this also ended up leading to the Red Scare, where Americans were scared to death of communists, they were scared of anarchists, anybody with radical views of government. All right, moving on from the boom, we're going to the bust. All right, everything that led up to the boom eventually caused part of the bust. So when we get to our bust, we're going to talk about farm sector crisis. Now during World War I, our farmers could grow whatever they wanted and somebody somewhere in the world was going to buy it. During World War, excuse me, the years after World War I, that's not necessarily the case. Um, farmers had overplowed the land in the 19 teens. Um, they overproduced. They took out loans that they couldn't pay back and eventually they got their farms foreclosed on them. The farm sector crisis eventually also sort of leads to the Dust Bowl that in combination with the drought and this leads to a lot of people ending up uh, migrating within the United States. And some of those migrants within the United States were called Okies. I remember Okies were people who left the Midwest and went out searching for work in California, which it wasn't always uh, readily available. Also, the availability of easy credit. All right, we also at this time had a shaky market that a lot of folks were speculating in. So all these are going to eventually lead up to the bus that's going to come down the road. And um, before I get too far that way, remember that there's already been a great deal of migration within the United States um, before World War II from the Okies moving west. Also, I'll put this should really go back before the boom. The Great Migration during World War One, when a lot of African Americans left the South for the first time to head north looking for jobs in factories and things like that, um, wartime industry. All right, and kind of in between the boom and the bust, I'm gonna stick the bonus army because that's something that you gotta know. All right, remember the bonus army was some, a group of veterans that went to DC. This was really after the depression's already started. They were trying to demand the pa um, passage of the patent bill or a bonus bill that was gonna give them a bonus that they were doing in 1945 and eventually the bonus army is broken up by guys like Patton MacArthur and Patton and MacArthur and um, this is what really gives Truman a real, I'm sorry Truman, this is what gives Hooper a bad name towards the end of his administration. Alright, so in our shift from bust to the New Deal, we can talk about President Hoover and his policies and remember Hoover believed in rugged individualism. He thought that if you give handouts, it's going to make people lazy. Now, this does not mean that he clung to that religiously throughout his term, but he did try to um, answer the bus through things like the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, or RFC, which remember that was part of what we call trickle-down economics. Make sure the top stays at the top, and the money's going to eventually get down to everybody else. And remember, this is also called voodoo economics. Eventually, it was called Reaganomics, and it's called supply-side economics. All right, but once Hoover does finally snap into action, there are some public works programs during Hoover's administration, things like Hoover Dam or Boulder Dam, but it was really too little too late. So, you know, ironically, we kind of find that um, Hoover is a lot um, along the lines of Roosevelt's thinking by the time that Roosevelt takes office. Um, one thing that we'll see from the bust all the way up to the recovery is that wages, Do not keep up with production um, increases. Let me make that clear for you.
All right. As the country becomes an industrial economy, we don't see wages um, rise like you would expect them to. All right. As we go from the bust to the New Deal, we're starting the road towards recovery. But it was a very slow road to recovery. All right. We've got to recognize with the New Deal, Roosevelt tackles a couple of things. He tackles relief first. This is going to be his first 100 days. And remember, the first thing he does for relief is declares a bank holiday. That's when banks were closed so they could be inspected and uh, people would hopefully trust these reinspected and open banks, reopened banks, and they're going to put their faith in them and believe that it's safer to put your money in a bank rather than under a mattress. And along with this will also include FDIC. Now, it's going to be very important you remember the four, well, the several New Deal agencies that are still around today. So one of those is going to be FDIC. Another New Deal agency that's around today is going to be the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the TVA, or the Tennessee Valley Authority, then also Social Security, which are all New Deal agencies or organizations that we're still clinging to. All right, now the New Deal, focus on relief at first. The next part of the New Deal is going to be recovery. So what can he do to help people recover? And that's going to be things like Federal Emergency Relief Act, which gave over $500 million in direct relief to the needy. And then the last big chunk of the New Deal is going to be reform. Now I'm going to try to cram a lot here into our New Deal section. Um, during the New Deal era, um, the Social Security is really going to come out of the second New Deal. So the first New Deal is going to focus on relief. The second New Deal is when we start to focus on recovery and reform. Um, remember, throughout all this era, there's a lot of immigration restrictions that are coming out in the 1920s. All right, there's a lot of reasons for that, um, a lot of nativism, and once we do get to the bus, people didn't want immigrants coming and taking jobs that could be available for Americans. Um, as we move on towards the New Deal, the name you need to recognize is going to be Harold Ix. He's the Secretary of the Interior. And he actually gets several things like the WPA, or Water Works Progress Administration passed, and that WPA lesson that Mr. Foreman did with you, remember where we were looking at murals in New Bern, employed a lot of people around the country. Um, another name you need to recognize with the New Deal as part of the economic philosophy behind it is going to be John Maynard Keynes. We talk about Keynesian economic theory. He believed that you had to prime the pump. All right, what this means is that the government needs to spend to get the country out of a recession. This is going to get the economy moving, and this was also tied in with deficit spending. Spending money that the government does not have. And that starts to lead to our national debt, but not as much as the uh, World War II spending efforts going to. All right. Along with that, uh, remember that Eleanor Roosevelt was instrumental in Franklin Roosevelt's administration um, with the New Deal. We also need to talk about the Indian New Deal, which was in one of your readings, or it's also called the Indian Reorganization Act, or the Wheeler. Howard Act. All right. And what this does is it takes the old Doll Severalty Act and wipes it off. Remember, the Dawes Act had tried to break up tribal land holdings, give it to individual Native Americans. Now those are uh, returned to tribal um, lands. And a lot of people still criticize the New Deal, thinking that it didn't do enough to help um, Native Americans. And the New Deal, you know, it had some successes in helping minorities also. Um, it was held back in some ways. Harold Ix, the Secretary of the Interior, and Eleanor Roosevelt, one thing they did to um, promote minority involvement in the government was they actually got Marian Anderson, who was denied the chance to sing at a, one of the prominent D.C. Um, venues. They got her a concert set quickly. I'm sorry, what's the The D.A.R.? She was associated with that? Eleanor Roosevelt. Oh, Eleanor Roosevelt quit the DAR over the Marion Anderson controversy. All right, and she eventually sang on the steps of Lincoln Memorial. 
um, due to Eleanor Roosevelt and Harold Hicks intervention. All right, so as we move on towards, from the New Deal towards recovery, you know, a lot of folks will say the New Deal uh, led to recovery, and you know, it wasn't all Roosevelt's planning. Um, he also incorporated what he called his brain trust, who were his most trusted advisors. And remember, Roosevelt actually denied Hoover's assistance at first. Um, he didn't want to be associated with that tainted Republican administration at all. Um, as we move towards recovery, though, remember what really gets the United States out of the um, Great Depression is going to be the spending for World War II. So as we increase defense spending, people are going to get jobs. Um, one thing that you also need to recognize is that the Lend-Lease Act, when that was passed, leads the United States becoming what we call the arsenal of democracy. All right, now by no means are these the only New Deal agencies you need to recognize. I picked a representative few of them, and I will say that it's going to be very important that you recognize the ones I said that are still around today. Um, the one thing that we also need to hit on that Roosevelt um, had a kind of roadblock to during the New Deal, or that process, was the Supreme Court. Now the Supreme Court, they declared the first Agricultural Adjustment Administration and the NIRA unconstitutional. All right, Roosevelt's plan for this was he wanted to attempt what was called court packing. And he tried to introduce legislation that would allow him to increase the number of justices up to actually 15 on the Supreme Court. It was going to allow him to appoint up to six new justices right away. And this plan was eventually shot down. Um, court packing was one thing that even though he had a majority of Democrats in Congress, they couldn't get on board with. Now, Roosevelt did eventually get to appoint several people to the Supreme Court um, who were more in line with his thinking, but his court packing plan, you need to recognize that, as failing. Um, just to say one more time, the FDIC got to recognize that as making people feel more secure in their bank deposits. And as we talk about the move towards World War II, you need to recognize that I probably should draw recovery a little down to U.S. entry into World War II. And what we got to recognize is that there were a lot of Americans that still weren't ready for the United States to get involved in another war. So people like the America First Committee were led by guys like Charles Lindbergh. All right, and they thought that we don't need to be involved in this war overseas. They were really focusing on the um, findings of folks like the Nye Committee. And the Nye Committee had found that after World War I, it was really just arms manufacturers and greed that got America involved in World War I. All right. Now, if you study all this stuff, um, you look at the stuff that we went over in the last few days on the new, excuse me, World War II again. And you look at all the information I'm going to send you the two review sheets, you should do final period seven tests you're going to take on Monday.